Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Ryan. I am the Associate Director for uh, at the Kaborkian Center for Near Eastern Studies here at NYU, and I'm going to be your MC and host today for uh, today's event in our uh, Global Uprising series. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today as we're finally uh, in spring uh, and, and nearing uh, the end of, of, of this series, which has been a really uh, fruitful and uh, fascinating series of discussions that we've been conducting since September, which have uh, taken as a sort of jumping off points the 10th anniversary of the uprisings uh, in the Arab world from 2011. Uh, we started this semester commemorating the uh, 10th anniversary of the revolution in Egypt uh, just this past week. We uh, commemorated the 10th anniversary of the beginning of uprisings in Syria, uh, along with the, I, I was noted the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune, uh, which it was in part a subject of the last event uh, in this series. Um, it, it, today's event uh, is the first in our final pair of events for the year, uh, focused on what we're calling the afterlives uh, of uprising. Uh, and we have a great uh, distinguished panel of uh, scholars and, and, and practitioners here, activists uh, with us today, uh, and then in a couple of weeks uh, to discuss about, you know, consider the topic of what happens after uprising and how we think individually and collectively uh, about uh, the, you know, partly the narrative, the movement, and the politics uh, that extend from uprising. Um, today's event uh, is titled Carcerality, Exile, and Disappearance. Uh, and we are asking here today uh, questions about how the narrative of uprising is shaped by violent encounters that happen during uh, and after uh, the event of uprising, how that ha helps us, you know, how it should uh, reframe our understanding of the event itself how uprising can continue uh, in forms of uh, exile, torture, violence uh, that extend well beyond uh, the event. Um, I'm going to uh, very, very quickly um, plug uh, the upcoming events that we have here at the Kevorkian Center. Uh, so you all know we'll have full information about this uh, in the chat. Uh, tomorrow, uh, if you are an Arabic uh, speaker and listener, we have a, a at the second installment of this year's uh, Arabic lecture series with Mona Karim. Uh, I highly encourage those of you who are interested to attend that. Uh, on April 1st, we have the next event in our digital forays series, Space and Place, Critical Mapping and Counter Cartography uh, with Majd al Shahabi, uh, Nermina Sharif, Ghazal Jafari, and the discussant Timur Hammond. Uh, on April 6th, the, the second event in this pair and the last event for the year uh, in global uprisings uh, is Afterlives of the Exile II, focused on borders, mobility, and movements uh, with our own Asla Isses, uh, Leopold Lambert from the Fun Ambulance, uh, A. Naomi Pike, uh, and, our, and the discussion for that event is uh, our own Paula Chakravarti. Uh, and lastly, before I, I, I turn to introducing uh, our, our panelists for today, um, I, I want to let folks know that the end of the uh, Digital Forays series is going to feature a, a special event uh, for which we're circulating a CFP uh, that is going to focus on, on new research uh, in, in digital uh, methods uh, in Middle East studies from emerging scholars. Uh, there's information on how you can apply to, to give a presentation as part of that uh, event uh, in the chat. All right. And so with us today, and I'm going to introduce everyone very, very briefly now, and then I'm going to turn things over to our panel to, to you know, provide their entry points. Uh, if you've been with us, you, you're familiar with the format. We'll have about 30 minutes of presentations and then 30 minutes of discussion uh, led by our discussant uh, today, and then we'll open things up uh, for Q&A. Uh, and we encourage anyone to ask questions uh, in the chat uh, at any time. You'll have an opportunity to discuss uh, your, your, your questions verbally if you, you wish to do so uh, once the audience Q&A portion begins. Um, today, we are really excited to have with us uh, Madiha Tahir, who is going to be our first speaker. Madiha is a, a journalist who has uh, 
uh, reported on uh, conflict, culture, and politics uh, in Pakistan. She's written for a wide range uh, of outlets, Foreign Affairs, Al Jazeera, Vice, uh, The National, uh, you name it, it seems like uh, she's has, she has words there and we're really pleased to have her with us, not only for that reason, but also because she's an alum uh, of our program uh, at, uh, in our master's program in Near Eastern Studies here at the Kevorkian Center, as well as the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. Um, our second speaker is going to be Rhonda Wahbe. Uh, she is a, a PhD candidate in anthropology with a secondary field in critical media practice at Harvard University. Uh, her dissertation in progress, which we hope is going to be finished soon, uh, it's much needed, uh, examines how Israel uses and exploits Palestinian dead bodies to surveil, control, and continuously dispossess and incarcerate the Palestinian population. Our third speaker uh, is Amina Zarouh. Uh, she is the assistant professor of sociology at Texas Christian University, where uh, she teaches and researches on uh, the politics uh, of forced disappearance in North Africa, uh, particularly in Libya. Her, her work on that, uh, that in forced disappearance in Libya, both before and after uh, the, the revolution uh, there is, I think, critical to this discussion. Um, and as well, uh, she has research on race and ethnicity in the United States. Um, she has a BA in sociology and government uh, and her MA and PhD in sociology from the University of Texas at Austin. Lastly, uh, but certainly not least, uh, our own Sinan Antun is going to serve as our discussant today. Uh, Sinan, for our crowd here at NYU, needs no introduction, but suffice it to say he's a, a poet, a novelist, a scholar, a translator, uh, and a professor of Middle East and Islamic studies, as well uh, as in the Gallatin Indiv School of Individualized Study here at NYU. Um, he has uh, many uh, works of, you know, important works of literary translation, and most recently, uh, his novel, uh, The Book of Collateral Damage, was released uh, in, uh, in 2019 from Yale University Press, and I send everyone uh, to that very, very important uh, book. All right, enough from me. I, I am really just over, over the moon to have uh, this group here to talk about this uh, important subject, and I want to pass things over to uh, Madiha. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really um, pleased actually to be here with uh, the other panelists and to be able to talk about this subject um, across different sites and spaces. I'm actually, I've also just now finished my PhD and I'm actually working on this topic and a postdoc here um, at Columbia. So I'm excited to kind of um, think about this stuff and think through it with all of you. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you today about, and I, I have my notes here on the side, so that's why I'm looking off to the side, um, is the anti-war movement uh, spearheaded by young ethnic Pashtuns in Pakistan. The movement is called the Pashtun Tahafuz, or Protection Movement, PTM for short. Um, and I want to start by outlining the conditions that give rise to this movement, specifically what it means to live and survive imperial violence under post-colonial conditions. The Pakistan-Afghanistan borderlands also called the tribal areas, have been the site of drone bombardment since 2004. But there have been no substantive US troops on the ground in Pakistan, and I think that's been crucial in obscuring the pervasive violence that has been unleashed following the war on terror. Now, over my career as, um, as a journalist, and then as a, um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, Over my uh, career as a journalist and then as a scholar, I've had friends, comrades, colleagues disappeared and sometimes killed. Particularly in the regions I have co covered, the Pakistan-Afghanistan borderlands, also called the tribal areas, and another restive province, Balochistan, the scene intensifies. Photos circulate on WhatsApp groups, a confession, a beheading, a bomb blast, a body twisted turned inside out. I once woke to photos of charred corpses, exposed bone, pink flesh, bloody as fresh butcher's meat. And it took me time to understand the diagram of these unholy bodies, where the legs should have been, where the mouth and the eyes must have once existed. The media relations arm of the Pakistani security forces had circulated the photos as evidence of a quote unquote successful counterattack against quote unquote insurgents. <clears throat> 
While it has garnered the most attention, the American uh, bombardment of the tribal areas is not a unique event. In addition to US drones uh, backed by uh, US, uh, the Pakistani Air Force backed by US funding and supply also bombs the tribal areas. It's carried out 5,500 bombing runs between 2008 and 2010 alone, dropping more than 10,600 bombs in that period. Now, conventional wisdom on drone bombardment is that the US chose drones as a viable option over detention. Killing suspects meant that the US would not have to imprison them at its detention sites that tend to draw scrutiny. But in Pakistan, and I think at other sites of the war on terror, the years of drone bombings have correlated with a largely uncharted expansion of carceral geographies within the country. Jails, prisons, Pakistani military and paramilitary bases, the rise of military courts, and unmapped secret detention centers. These sites and spaces now sustain a regime of carceral punishments, detentions, disappearances, and extrajudicial killings. What I'm trying to point out here then is that the US has been very adept at displacing and dispersing its war making among transnational security assemblages. Understanding and mobilizing against this distributed empire requires moving beyond the evident infrastructures and technologies of direct US involvement. It requires probing the opaque network of technologies and actors that stretch from the US military to Pakistani security forces, militias, informants, and all manner of strongmen who constitute the literal and figurative lifeblood of this war. Ethnic Pashtuns, the second largest ethnic group in Pakistan, are one of the primary targets of this apparatus. They are constituted as what Samar al Balushi calls citizen suspects, that is, as objects of surveillance and coordinated assemblages of police power. The practices to which they have been subject have now radiated to the rest of the country. For instance, at the archives I go to, some records are inexplicably missing. In the markets since the war on terror began, the basic maps of the tribal areas go missing. People begin to go missing. Bodies are thieved, dumped, disfigured. This is the condition of being made lapata or namalum, that is being made unknown by the unknown. It generates fear and paranoia and ambiguity. For Pakistanis, it also generates the sense of a spectral sovereign, an invisible, an invisible ghostly but pervasive force that interrupts our sense of the real. We now refer to this spectral sovereign by unearthly names, Namalum Afrad, unknown individuals, Khalai Makhluk, space creatures or aliens, Farishte, angels, number one. Americans ever in the sway of the technological sublime are now in awe of the drone and its alleged control of the heavens. But for many Pakistanis at least, the heavens are rather populated. Now this is what finally sparked PTM. In 2018, a police officer in Karachi, uh, Pakistan, shot and killed a young ethnic Pashtun. The policeman, Rao Anwar, tried to claim that the murdered man was a militant. It turned out, however, that the man he had killed, Nakibullah Mesud, was an aspiring fashion model and had a large social media following. The movement's Pashta language rallying cry, the Sangha Zadida, what kind of freedom is this, exposes the yawning gap, the dissensus, as Ranciere would say, between freedom from colonial rule on the one hand and the overwhelming violence to which Pashtuns are subject. This includes everything from checkpoints and bombing raids to drone attacks, military operations, Islamist guerrilla attacks, and petty humiliations. There are dozens of committed activists driving the movement, but its charismatic figurehead is Manzur Pashtin, a young war displaced Pashtun from the tribal areas. Manzur's speeches honed through his religious training as well as his activism are characterized not by abstract axioms, but by anecdote, narrative, and embodied experience. In one speech, for instance, he recounts people from his village having to collect the body parts of children killed in military bombings. Their parts would be put into sacks and then buried. He then goes on to remark, and I quote, the Pashtuns have not seen a respectable life in this state of ours, and we have not seen a respectable death either. When I speak about my dignity, when I speak about my life, first, they try to kill me for it. When I escape their circle of death, they label me a spy of raw, the India intelligence services, 
or NDS, Afghanistan Intelligence Services, a traitor, a rebel, a terrorist. If bringing peace to the Pashtun nation is traitorous or rebellious, if we are called raw, NDS, or the spy of another agency, we are not. But still, if that is what they say we are, then yes, so we are. In hearing this speech, I am reminded strongly of Fanon who wrote that the fella, the unemployed and the starving do not lay claim to the truth. They do not say they represent the truth because they are the truth in their very being. The body of the so-called Pashtun trader no longer only signifies the force of the spectral sovereign. In the context of the movement, it declares another truth. That is that the state views the Pashtun call for dignity as a threat. This is why instead of investigating the ubiquitous daily violations that led to the PTM protests, the authorities charged six activists in the Pashtun region of Savat with terrorism and sedition for daring to organize a protest against checkpoints. And this is why instead of dealing with disappearances, they jailed the archivist of Pashtun disappearances and devastation, um, Alam Zeb Mehsud, twice. It is not the protest per se, but the capacity of PTM to use the dead, disappeared, and disfigured body to express the truth of sovereign violence that has so terrified the establishment. The truth has got away from them. On a late night around 1 a.m. when we pull over to a roadside cafe in the city of Peshawar, Manzur jumps out of the car to stretch his legs. Even in the dark of the night and the dim of the light bulb, stragglers recognize his profile. They approach, smiles wide, hearts open. They hug him and shoulder in for selfies. Um, the selfie with Manzur too is an expression of longing to be loved and wanted and held amidst political conditions that encode Pashtuns as suspect figures. Selfie by selfie by selfie, this longing becomes political force, a movement. This is new for us. We are thirsty for comradeship and camaraderie. We are thirsty for the intensity of love born through struggle. At a rally of roughly 20,000, my friend talks about how inspiring it is to have thousands screaming with you. This thing called terrorism, uniform is behind it. You begin to feel as though you are paranoid because there is nothing around you, no one who shares your view. Where is the insane asylum? Ali is somewhere nearby. He is a survivor of an American drone bombing. Then he lost an uncle when the uniform killed him, disfigured him and dumped his body. He has no evidence that it was the uniform. I have no evidence that it was the uniform other than the repetition of the same story, the same story, the same story across the tribal areas and Balochistan. I choose to believe those who recovered the body. I choose to believe those who had to carry that rotting corpse and plan its hasty burial. I choose to believe. Solidarity is perhaps then a kind of ethical surrender, a practice of radical belief, over and against the conditions of illegibility, suspicion, and uncertainty. We still chase scraps of information that could be called evidence. We still make our little files. We still know we must walk the line between believing and being believable. But the, but the movement has enlarged our capacity for language and imagination. Arab Spring, Pashtun Spring, Tribal Intifada, Black Lives Matter, Pashtun Lives Matter. Against the sometimes sclerotic language of appropriation, we borrow and trade dreams and aspirations as freely as hashtags and slogans. Does the world know that its center runs through us, my friend says? West is dead. Anything interesting will come from the South. We talk big, and at last, finally, we begin to say, we know who the unknown ones are. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nadiha. Um, it's very powerful and, and, and amazing work. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Rhonda Wehbe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madiha, for that very powerful 
narrative. Um, I'd also like to thank the Kevorkian Center and Jared, James, Nasser, and Fidel for organizing this series and giving me a chance to discuss a little bit of my ethnographic work um, and to be in conversation with you all on this topic. Um, I was really mulling over this question that was in the prompt of what happens to life after uprising. And I was thinking a lot about what is most at stake in insurrection and in rebellion. And I kept coming back to this interview that I did nearly 10 years ago, um, prior to even embarking on this research. And it was with a political prisoner who had just been released after 34 years in prison. He had, is one of the most, the longest serving Palestinian political prisoners. And we were talking about all of the hunger strikes he had endured over the years and the difficulty of them, the stakes, how much sacrifice they require, and how much the prisoners put online for the demands of basic human dignity, for things like family visits, for going out into the yard, for clean water, for sufficient food, even for a pen and paper to be able to write down things. Um, and he kept bringing up how high their, the stakes were. And not only are you putting your life on the line, but if you die during a hunger strike, you may not even have proper burial rights. And so he kept talking about this and I kept probing him. And finally, he told me about the case of Anis Abdawle. Anis Abdawle was a prisoner in the late 1970s. He was part of the 1980 hunger strike in Nafha prison. It is one of the largest mass hunger strikes among Palestinian prisoners to this day, uh, and one of the largest rebellions and joint rebellions in the prison. Um, and so the prisoners faced a lot of repression for rebelling. Um, and Anis Dawla was one of the prisoners who was force fed. Um, during the hunger strike. And during one of these force feeding sessions, his lung was punctured and he died several days later inside the prison from the complications of that. His, fam his body was never returned to his family. Instead, his body was whisked away by the Israeli army in front of the other prisoners. And he was interred in an undisclosed location for him to finish out the remainder of his sentence. And he was never seen again, basically. Um, and what's really harrowing is for years after this, the family attempted to retrieve Anissa's remains, even going to the military courts, going to the Israeli Supreme Court to demand his remains back. And they were always being ping ponged back and forth. They told the family that they had actually released him and he decided not to come home. Um, they told the family that indeed he did die inside the prison, but they couldn't find his remains and back and forth and back and forth. And even until today, he's never been buried in his hometown of Kalkilia, which is what his family has wished for, for decades. And this conversation was really striking to me and kept coming back to me when thinking about this, because it kind of revealed the internal processes for prisoners, how even for them who are ready to sacrifice their lives during the hunger strike for basic rights and have already sacrificed their freedom, know that they cannot escape punishment as Palestinian resistors, even in death. And so Israeli settler colonialism kind of elevates this concept of criminalization by detaining the bodies into death and elonging the control and hold over the Palestinian people. So this isn't just about land and territorial acquisition. It's about controlling the Palestinian people and their narrative through continuous, relentless, and timeless uh, criminalization. And unfortunately, Anissa's case is not an exceptional one. I work with the National Campaign for the Retrieval of Martyrs, um, who have been collecting testimonies from families since 2008. It's a group of families, of martyrs, of activists, and grassroots organizers. And they have collected testimonies from uh, families of 254 Palestinian martyrs who are interred in these Israeli military operated and restricted grave sites that Palestinians called the cemeteries of numbers. And they have cases of people from the 1960s into the present who are interred in these sites. And Palestinians call them the cemeteries of numbers because these Palestinians are stripped of their identity. They're given a numbered placard that supposedly connects with their name, but oftentimes they are never found and are disappeared, uh, to use Medija's language. Um, 
for decades after as the families try to find them for retrieval. And since 2015, there's been an increase in insurrection by Palestinians um, against Israeli colonialism as it continues to entrench itself. And so the policy to withhold bodies uh, from the families after their death has ramped up. And we also now have 75 Palestinian corpses that are in Israeli police morgue refrigerators and they refuse to return them to the families despite numerous attempts by human rights organizations and by the families to retrieve them. And we also have, in addition to Anis Daule, nine Palestinian prisoners who have recently died in Israeli jails due to torture or medical negligence who have not been returned to their families. So this escalating policy to confiscate Palestinian dead bodies is punishment not just for the person who resisted the Israeli state, but it's punishment for the families who are denied from carrying out burial rites and traditions that they hold sacred and important to them for religious and, um, and cultural reasons. And like in the case of Anis Daule, where the family has been trying to get um, his remains back for decades. Many, many families have a lack of closure who never receive official confirmation of the death of a loved one. And there was one very um, difficult case that I recorded, which was the brother of a martyr who was telling me about his brother who had um, disappeared and had been thought to be dead um, in the late 70s and taken to the cemeteries of numbers, but they never received confirmation and the family had kept hope that he was still alive and his mother spent the rest of her life until she died searching in jails and prisons across Palestine, across the Arab world to see if her son was still alive. And a lot of families that I interview say that they have, they cannot until they see the body with their own eyes truly believe their son is uh, is dead um, and truly like start to begin the grieving process. So I think this is a form of cosmological warfare that's levied against the families from denying them the ability to grieve and be at peace about the loss of their loved ones. And Palestinian sociologist Sohad Dahir Nashif calls this denial of the ability to grieve as suspended death because it alters the temporality of death and death rituals that the survivors need. And also many of the families refer to their martyr children as mahjuzin or detained because they're being held in custody indefinitely in death and are still being held as if they are going to be tried as if a case is going to be brought against them. So they see this direct link between criminalization, incarceration and the politics of death. And while this practice has been going on for decades and it's a horrible desecration of the sanctity of dead, Israel has also found value in using these Palestinian corpses as bargaining chips. So in September 2019, decades and decades after this practice has been happening kind of informally, there was a landmark Supreme Court case that ruled it was permissible for the Israeli state to hold the bodies for future negotiations with the Palestinian Authority. So not only is the dead body criminalized, not only is the sanctity of the dead desecrated and the family punished, but now the dead, Palestinian dead body is seen as a bargaining tool in Israel's eyes to possibly make territorial gains, to quell resistance of Palestinians, to deter Palestinians, and to retrieve the remains of captured soldiers and so forth. So this practice itself is showing how the Palestinian body becomes commodified and becomes a form of currency in the Israeli settler colonial regime rather than as sacred. Um, and I think the final point I want to make here because we're talking about narratives and afterlives of uprising is that the punishment of the family does not stop with the confiscation of the corpse and the denial of grieving. The families are often surveilled and punished for years and decades after a loss of a loved one. So in one um, interview that I did and one case that I was following, uh, one martyr's father, and I'm gonna name him Esam al to keep him anonymous, um, was telling me at length about 
how long it took him to build his home from saving up from working several jobs as a teacher, as a tailor, as doing upholstery. And he was finally able to build a home for his family outside of the refugee camp in 2002. Several months later, his son was implicated in a martyrdom mission um, and his body was taken and never retrieved by the family. And the family was left to grieve without being able to bury their son. Months after that, in the middle of the summer, the Israeli army came to their home in the middle of the night. Um, they gave them 15 minutes to clear their belongings and then they detonated the home in front of the entire family and brought it to the ground and completely leveled it. And he spent a lot of time telling me about this because he was telling me about how his family had been uprooted time and again. They were Nekbe refugees from the village of Jilia in 1948. They came to a refugee camp. They've been uprooted yet again and the Israeli army still keeps to following them. And not only that, the entire extended family that had the same last name as them was punished for 10 years. They were given travel bans for 10 years, meaning they could not go on Hajj or on Umrah, which were really important to them to complete their religious um, beliefs. They had their work permits revoked. They were not allowed to enter Jerusalem to pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. Many of the male family members were arrested and they were under constant surveillance by the Israeli army. So the entire family for over a decade was choked and suffocated by the Israeli regime for, um, for the resistance of one of their family members. And all of these stories that I've been detailing about the hunger strikes, about um, the confiscation of the bodies of all of the continued surveillance and monitoring and punishment of families is what has made us characterize Israel as a necropolitical state because of the way they use death and dying as a form of control over Palestinians. But what I really want to end with here is how the afterlives of uprising also illustrate to us the limitations of the necropolitical reality that are imposed on Palestinians and the very ways that people's narratives teach us what they believe is resilience and resistance despite all of these present uh, violent mechanisms that are trying to strip Palestinians of humanity and of dignity and rights. Um, for, for example, Assam al Titi, after laying out all the repercussions that their family had faced and the number of times they've had to rebuild their life over and over again, and the surveillance that they're under and, uh, and had endured because of the resistance that their son had done, they had still not buried their son 19 years later when I had done um, this interview with them. And when I asked him if he had planned to pursue any further avenues to locate his son's remains, he told me, and I'm directly quoting from my transcript here. We said, if he's in the cemeteries of numbers or wherever he is on the land of Palestine, it is sacred and all of it is one. Why? Because we did not want it to be a point of weakness where the Israelis can put pressure and use the returning of his corpse to make us to things. So we said, no, he's on the land of Palestine and on Holy Land. So whether in Bethlehem or Ramallah or in the north, it doesn't matter. He is with God. His soul is up with God. And I think here we can take cue from the families of martyrs on what resistance looks like from the day to day or the ways they've refashioned the afterlives of uprising by determining the narrative as one of resilience and defiance to the ongoing violence against them. And we see this narrative mastered all over Palestinian towns and villages and cities. And I just want to share one photo that I took in Ramallah a few years ago that shows how martyrs are in our everyday presence. One moment. Um, I took this photo on Rukab Street. It's one of the most heavily trafficked streets um, in the town. And these are the stencils of Adil and Ahmad Awadallah below and above is Basil al-Araj. And these were stenciled at different times. They were about three years apart. And Adil and Ahmad Awadallah are two brothers who were assassinated by Israel in 1998 and whose bodies were taken and then released only 16 years later by Israel as part of a goodwill measure during political negotiations. And I use goodwill you know, a little bit facetiously. 
And these goodwill, um, these political negotiations have failed since, of course. Um, and the stencil above is a stencil of Basil al-Araj, who was assassinated in March of 2017, and his body was withheld for 12 days before he was returned to his family in Wadaje. And these stencils, to me, they really signify how much the presence of there, Israel has worked so hard to criminalize and invisibilize through these policies. And I took this photo because I was really struck by the overlapping nature of this actual physical and visible timeline of Palestinian martyrdom that's plastered on the walls for everyone to see and to remember and to commemorate every day and really to be part of our everyday existence when we're walking around. And finally, I think I was thinking about their names and how significant means bravery, Adin means fairness and justice, and Ahmad means a pillar of support. And their names themselves are a symbol of what resilience and resistance stands for and means for the Palestinian people. It takes bravery and courage to continue to fight against colonialism. The demand is and has always been justice and it requires a unified community of support as a pillar of strength to endure the struggle against colonization and occupation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Uh, that was incredibly uh, insightful and powerful as well. Uh, I want to turn now to Amina Zaru, and from there we'll go to Sinan Antun. Thank you so much, and um, a big thank you to the Kevorkian Center uh, for Near Eastern Studies for inviting us, um, and to the organizers who I know work tirelessly to provide the space for us to, to converse. I think um, in my remarks, I think you'll see resonance with what Madiha and, and Rhonda have said. Um, it just in a slightly different context. And um, I'm hoping to emphasize kind of some of uh, Rhonda's concluding points about how disappearance opens this unique space for what we could regard as unprecedented forms of activism and resistance against the state, despite its sort of character as one of the most repressive types of state violence that we could imagine. Um, and so what I'm hoping to bring to this panel is sort of a, the perspective of a sociologist um, and one uh, who has studied movements against disappearance in the context of Libya and North Africa. Um, and, and for a source of direction and inspiration, uh, I would like to start with an experience I had when I was in Tripoli in 2014, conducting interviews with families of primarily men who had been disappeared by the Libyan state in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and so my, my work revolved around interviewing families who took part in a social movement that preceded the 2011 uprisings that was gathering families on behalf of searching for disappeared relatives, kind of as Madiha attested to earlier, as well as, as Rhonda in the Palestinian context. Um, and just for some historical background, um, even though disappearance is a form of state violence that prevails across the world, um, the sort of specifics of disappearance, of course, vary by the socio-cultural context. And so in the, in the context of Libya, um, it is estimated that hundreds, possibly thousands of men, uh, largely men, some women, were disappeared under the uh, regime of Muammar Gaddafi, which for those familiar, um, Gaddafi assumed power in a military coup in 1969 um, and disappearances largely occurred in, with the greatest force in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and the sort of category of, of people who were disappeared were really anyone who could be perceived as being oppositional to the state. And this took many forms. Uh, one in particular uh, that has garnered less attention um, was the disappearance of, uh, again, primarily men who were perceived to be oppositional to Gaddafi for religious reasons, um, namely that Gaddafi sort of instrumentalized religion 
for his own political ends. So one example would be um, he, in a particular era of his rule, actually sort of installed imams throughout Masajid in, in Libya as a way of surveilling the population and also as a way of curtailing opposition. And so this was, of course, met with a lot of criticism around the country. And it led to what effectively became a surveillance of, of Masajid for people who were suspected of opposing him. And so anyone who was perceived to be particularly devout, this could take the form of the ways by which they were dressing or in particular their attendance at specific prayer times like the Fajr prayer, the dawn prayer, could be viewed by the state as possibly engaged in some sort of uh, oppositional movement that was mobilizing under the rubric of Islam. And so it was in this context that um, a, a woman I interviewed named Maryam experienced the disappearance of her brother, Rafiq. And um, Rafiq disappeared after leaving for an early dawn prayer in 1989. Uh, Maryam's family only learned of the disappearance because some neighbors actually observed um, Rafiq being sort of pulled into a vehicle and being driven away. Um, since 1989, she has had difficulty confirming with the state whether Rafiq was in their possession. Um, and over the course of several years since 1989, she began to be connected to this movement that started in Eastern Libya in Benghazi in 2008, 2009, that was predicated on trying to learn about the fate of um, disappeared men like Rafiq. And so I first met Maryam in 2014 in Tripoli. She was part of uh, the leadership in the Tripoli branch of this uh, Rabita, this family association. And she invited me after I met her at this association headquarters, she invited me to her home to tell me more about Rafiq her family's experiences, searching for his whereabouts. And as soon as I entered her home um, and we were turning to enter the marbua or the sitting room, I observed a picture that was on a console table. And this picture I had seen also um, on some of her social media, her Facebook profile, which is how we communicated. Um, and this picture was essentially like a graphic design that featured the pictures of two men. And these were both her brothers. Um, on one side was Rafiq, who had disappeared in 1989. And then the other was her brother, Adel, who had been killed by security forces in 2011 in the uprising. And in this graphic design, of course, as Rhonda was pointing out, um, both of these men were deemed shahada or martyrs. And so this is the sort of first picture that greets you as soon as you enter the family home. Um, and as we settled into the sitting room, the marbua, and I'm meeting her family members, talking with her mothers, uh, her mother and uh, other relatives, a little boy kind of stumbles into the room uh, and this turns out to be her sister's son. And he was rather shy and so he kind of sought refuge at uh, the feet of his grandmother and was kind of hiding um, in the folds of her dress. And uh, his grandmother was imploring him to introduce himself, but he was, you know, very coy. And so Medium turned and looked at him and sort of as a way of introducing him said, this is my sister's son. He has been named Rafiq, but it's not him. And so it was clear to me in that moment, in this interaction, that Rafiq lived on in this family in so many different ways. But there was also this sort of tension in the family where for Maryam, despite the honorific of Rafiq being given to her nephew, it reinforced his status as disappeared and as missing. And so just to sort of using this interaction as a point of departure to think about this panel and the subject of disappearance, 
So what I'd like to emphasize is that for a family like Mediums, uh, for families who have had members disappear, the violence of the state or the entity responsible is long lasting and it's interconnected. So here we had the deaths of Rafiq and Adel, very different time periods over 20 years apart. But in this picture on that console table was intertwined was regarded as a continuity, a continued violence that's being endured by this single family. And then sort of secondly, an, another observation to make about this interaction is that clearly disappearance is an extremely powerful form of state violence in the sense that it functions in ways to sort of erase someone from existence, to malign their memory, as Rhonda was saying, that has extended effects on the families left behind. They have, you know, what sociologist Irving Goffman would call a courtesy stigma. You know, they're carrying the stigma of the disappeared person as well. So as all of that is um, undeniably the case, disappearance also has this unintended consequence, which Rhonda was speaking to as well, which is that it creates a lack of closure. It creates a rupture that opens up a very important space for resistance because the memory of someone like Rafiq is extremely raw. He is present despite his absence. And for me, this sort of illustrates some very important points about disappearance that I think make it distinct and again, open the possibilities for resistance. So one, as I've been intimating, is those protracted effects on the family that's left behind. These are emotional. As Madiho was saying, these are profoundly psychological. And there are financial strains created by disappearance that can compel people into spaces of activism and opposition to the state. Um, and one point I'd like to make in our panel, kind of an answer to that question, how does disappearance make us reconsider what the meanings of uprising are? Very often, these insecurities and strains introduced by disappearance can become misrecognized when we analyze activism. So for instance, um, we may observe cases of activism and attribute the cause to an economic grievance, when really that economic grievance is created, motivated by state violence that took away breadwinners. Um, this is arguably the case in some of the uprisings in 2011 across North Africa. Much of the conversation emerges um, around economic deprivation and unemployment, which say in the case of Tunisia's Mohamed Bouazizi, who self-immolates, is arguably key to, to that, that act but also a really important dimension of what he endured was consistent pervasive harassment and degradation by representatives of the state in the form of the local police officers. Um, so police, um, planes, clothes, officers, whoever the sort of representative of the state is, um, in these actions demonstrates the impunity of the state to humiliate, violate, and physically abuse average citizens. Um, this is kind of similar in, in a way to less attention that was paid to the Egyptian claim, we are all Khalid Saeed, which was um, a young man who was killed early in the 2011 uprisings. Uh, a key grievance across those protests were disappeared people or people who were, were harmed by state violence in the North African context. Um, in the case of Libya, when we recognize the significance of disappearance and the family mobilizations against it, what becomes legible is that protests did not begin on the planned day of February 17th, but actually began two days earlier when the state arrested uh, a lawyer and activist in this family association named Fethi Tarbul. And then families in response to this preemptive arrest um, gathered in the streets. And so actually the story of the Libyan uprising in 2011 is catalyzed by the state's attempt 
to curtail uh, a leader of a family movement around disappearance. And so those are just a few examples of how understanding disappearance and its extended effects on people left behind can help us reconsider um, uprising in retrospect. Um, and then secondly, just a point of emphasis that maybe we can talk through um, in our discussion is that other distinctive quality of disappearance, which is the profound uncertainty about what happened to an individual who has disappeared. So again, I think in emphasizing points of resistance, the uncertainty opens up this space of mobilization and activism that other forms of state violence may not. Um, so again, families experience a lack of closure because they cannot confirm their loved one's death or engage in the formal rituals of closure like funerals, as Rhonda was saying. So it creates this protracted mourning that is left unresolved. In the Libyan context, families were specifically instructed not to hold funerals for disappeared men who the state later claimed had died in um, what some of you may have heard of as a, a, a massacre of 1,200 prisoners at Buslim prison in Tripoli, a notorious political prison. Um, so uh, this uncertainty, this ambiguity actually can become a mobilizing force in ways that, at least from the sociological perspective, is not very well predicted by existing scholarship. There's this assumption when people study social movements that a necessary condition of mobilizing people is that you're generating consensus and certainty and that that unites people to then go and protest or engage in activism. And I think all of the cases that we're considering here today illustrate that uncertainty, ambiguity, the absence of uh, certitude actually can compel people into really unprecedented forms of resistance to state violence and potentially sustain movements for far longer than other kinds of mobilizing issues. Um, so just as an, an example with which many people may be familiar, the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo the uh, movement of Argentine mothers uh, in Latin America against disappearance, where, where disappearance occurred <clears throat> extensively, um, particularly 1970s. Um, that movement continues to this day, trying to document and account for the state's violence, including locating and forensically analyzing remains to try to, to acquire that knowledge that people deserve and are, are um, seeking. So um, I guess in conclusion, I'd like to sort of invite us to revisit the title of the panel as afterlives of uprising, because it reminds me of the designation of people like Meriam's brother Rafiq, as well as those who died during the protests and armed uprisings in 2011 as martyrs. And, and Rhonda spoke to this as well. Uh, so the martyr in many Islamic interpretations is someone who has sacrificed on behalf of a particular cause, um, but lives on in the company of God. And so the martyr actually occupies this sort of liminal status, venerated, but living on in multiple senses of after, in the spiritual sense, or you know, in the context we've been discussing in the lives of families left behind. Um, and so we could think about resistance to disappearance as a type of afterlife, a type of mobilization that occurs because of the ambiguities between life and death introduced by this form of state violence. And again, to underscore, uh, this is a type of mobilization that actually has the potential to not only create unprecedented forms of contesting the state, but also sustaining and bringing in further uh, communities into sort of the critique of the state in ways that I don't think is fully appreciated in a lot of discussions of state violence. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much for that, Amina. It was very insightful and, and really well uh, put and argued. Uh, I'm going to turn things over now to Sinan and Tun for some reflections and a series of questions uh, and a discussion between our panelists. Uh, after probably 20 minutes or so, we're going to uh, turn things over to audience Q&A. So I encourage folks to post questions <coughs> in the chat at this time. Thank you, Jim. And I also would like to echo the fellow panelists and thanking uh, Nasser, Jared, and Fidel. And um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you all for these really powerful and poignant um, presentations. Um, I, I think the, you know, the issue of the narratives and the narrative frames through which we remember or think of uprising is, is, is very important. And just a few comments about, you know, in the last 10 years, the ways in which these uprisings in the Arab world and elsewhere, I, I just see two tendencies often. The initial exhilaration and enthusiasm of hope, of course, but then so many uh, rush to hasty postmortems, uh, whether for academic reasons, turning these uprisings into objects of study, Whereas as we can see today, and as we should always see, it's a, they are not events, they are structures, they are continuing, there might be ebb and flow, but it is some who are privileged who can look away and not listen to what is really happening on the ground. And that's where I think some of the questions posed in the framing of this event are really, really crucial. What are the voices that are left out uh, and why? So, and definitely, um, you know, so much of what, there's so much overlap and despite all the particularities of the different contexts and the places, but alas, we know from history and we know from recent history that um, the mechanisms of terror also are shared between regimes and states. And so I must say a few words about Iraq because of the Iraqi uprising and because the anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Iraq, uh, which led to, uh, many would argue, the catastrophes in Iraq and in the region passed a few days ago without much notice in this country and, and elsewhere. But definitely carcerality, exile, and disappearance. I mean, 900 Iraqi, young Iraqi men and women were killed. Um, and, and so many were forced to to go to Iraqi Kurdistan or to Turkey, of course, to escape the terror network of the Iraqi state and of its militias. And just to also highlight the issue of, of disappearance, um, there are so many examples and cases, but one uh, that comes to mind is that in uh, 2019, a human rights lawyer, Ali Chasib, and also an activist uh, was kidnapped, like so many Iraqi activists, many women. Uh, he was kidnapped in 2019. And speaking of the of how the memory um, is sustained by the family, his father um, kept pushing uh, and kept questioning the authorities and the powers that be, and appearing and participating in demonstrations and protests and appearing on TV stations whenever possible and composing poetry to ask for the whereabouts of his son. And sadly, 20 days ago, the father himself was assassinated, I guess, in order to um, quiet this. And this is just one of many, many um, examples um, in, in Iraq and elsewhere. I guess, as I shared with, with the wonderful panelists before, I, I don't want this to be a question and answer period. It's gonna be a conversation. I'm just gonna throw a few thoughts out there, but I guess the, the continuities and the, and the overlap um, is, is really fascinating and, and so important. But I just wanna emphasize again, the, which came out especially in the last um, presentation, the, the, the problematic always of misunderstanding uh, uprisings is where we place beginnings and where we place ending. And it might be too poetic and radical to think uh, to not think of beginnings of endings, but think of shifts and think of continuities. And we see that whether in the Pakistani case, in Libya, especially this applies to Iraq and how people misjudge and misrecognize the effects of uh, dictatorship and the beginning of war as if it's really a complete break and as if there are no continuities in terms of power, in terms of geopolitics. Um, I guess, um, 
I, I, I think one of the challenges for many of us is how to parse and think of the complex power and terror networks, imperial power, but how it is inflected locally. So perhaps Madiha or others could elaborate a little bit. I like the term that you use, distributed empire, to think of the networks and the sites. And then the, the striking quote that you used, which is about the West runs through us. So I guess, how can we think of and look for terms or tools to help us better understand this complex network of imperial and local power? Um, and how these, you know, whether militias or states or paramilitary groups are working. Um, um, with both Mediha and Randa's presentations, of course, the body uh, comes through as a very important site of truth uh, as a last weapon, but also, of course, a site of vulnerability. And I couldn't help but think of Benjamin because I'm eternally obsessed with Benjamin and of his notion that even the dead will not be safe if the enemy continues to be victorious. And I mean, there has been recent work on Benjamin in Palestine. But to me, this is, of course, so painful, but it's just an egregious example of, of where settler colonialism can go and um, turning the dead into a commodity, turning the Palestinian corpse into an object, and basically extending the settling and the colonizing of the land to the body itself, which is the last refuge in a way. And, you know, the cemeteries of the numbers completely erasing identity or trying to, of course, which is, which is impossible. So I, I would also want us to um, go back to, as a pest optimist, I want to go back to some sense of hope that was found in all of your presentations, but to try to be a, a pest optimist in the, in the Gramscian sense. Um, and I guess, um, with uh, Amina, um, I completely, I, I would also want us to want you to elaborate all of you about the problems of misrecognition and misidentifying a lot of the events and the personas. But I guess the issue you bring up in terms of uh, attributing the factors that led to the uprising, whether uh, one disproportionately attributes them or explains them through economic aspects or whether it's police violence and brutality, as you mentioned. But my question is, why can't we combine all of these together in order, uh, rather than privilege one at the expense of the other? Um, you know, the same, I mean, in a way, the same disagreement or debate rages whenever we have any uprising. The same thing happened in, in, in Iraq, in a way, uh, which brings me I guess I'm laying out all the questions now. The, the, the problematic of how certain personas and subjectivities are more legible in the Anglophone global world. So that the icons of certain uprisings in Western media and parts of Western academia uh, do are not identical to the actual heroes such as the one that Madiha and Randa and you mentioned on the ground. And I mentioned Iraq because Many forget that the initial wave of the October uprising was by very impoverished working class uh, folks whose um, you know, kiosks were completely destroyed by the state and so on and so forth. But of course, later when the uprising developed into something much more expansive and the you know, uh, many uh, families from the middle class joined in, that became more legible, sadly to the wide, wider world is that it's middle-class uprising and so on and so forth. Um, these are some of the, I mean, there are other questions as well. Uh, uh, one is, um, in a way, Mehdi had touched on this. I'm always um, interested in the instances, um, how the war on terror, of course, uh, its vocabulary and its methods um, allowed these states and regimes to even extend their own network of terror and appropriate uh, all of these new techniques. Um, and I guess also another important question uh, is instances and examples of regimes and states appropriating the narratives 
and the discursive force of the protests and revolts and reorienting them and embedding them in something that combines the war on terror and the discourse on security and, and so on and so forth. I mean, we see this in Egypt, we see this everywhere. Um, there are other questions, but I, I, I don't wanna take up too much time and I encourage you to jump in and talk amongst yourselves. I could, I could start perhaps. Um, so uh, I, I think I wanted to pick up on of many of your questions, you know, on um, the kind of hope, the optimistic one uh, to start. And I think something that I was observing throughout all of our commentaries was the central role of, of the family across all of these contexts. And I think that is really significant because very often, and all of us would know this, um, when we see uh, represented, particularly in um, the US media in particular, but certainly extends beyond it, that the, the family or these larger kin groupings that sometimes get maligned in the language of tribe, um, that these are often presented to us as uh, spaces that inhibit freedom, or they're seen as these oppressive parochial, antiquated forms of social solidarity and organization that um, are legacies in, in, in this region of the world that is North Africa and the Middle East. And I think part of what um, some of these mobilizations that we're speaking to address is that sort of reorienting us to think about kin groups as a space that is productive for contesting the state, that actually humanizes individuals in ways that other sites are dehumanizing them is a really important intervention in understanding who key actors in politics can be. Uh, and that's something that I think is, is worthy of, of underscoring and maybe tracing further across our, our varying contexts. Um, speaking from a sociological space, um, very often we think about in a Eurocentric lens that class is the most critical mechanism of contesting power. But here we see kin groups that, uh, whether they're large or small, uh, are, are really important actors in advancing projects that relate to emancipation. And so I think that's something that perhaps is unites our panel in a, in a unique way. I'll jump off from there. Um, I, I, I loved the other presentations and they got me um, thinking in some ways about, um, I don't know what you're saying about kin groups. Um, you know, I was thinking as, as, as I was listening to your presentation and to Rhonda's presentation about disappearance as an, as an inheritance um, in the sense that, you know, you, you were talking about um, Rafiq and Adil, the two brothers who many, you know, decades apart uh, actually were still interconnected in this process of disappearance slash I think extrajudicial killing that happened. And um, Rhonda, you had spoken about altering the temporality of death and in some ways inheritance really is about, you know, the passing on, there's a temporal aspect to it. Um, and the ways in which I think families, you know, at least in Pakistan, one of the ways that the state attacks is to attack family. So if they don't get the, the, the person, and I suspect this happens in other sites as well, they will get the cousin or the brother or the father or somebody else um, in order to um, kind of put pressure. And people who have been exiled or are self-exiled, their families end up being in danger, oftentimes um, women, because those are the ones who are left actually. Um, so there's a gendered aspect to this as well that I think gets sometimes gets obscured in this process. Um, so that was kind of one of the things I was thinking about, just in thinking about disappearance as a kind of presence, presencing as a, as a thing that is there as an inheritance that we all like kind of these families and these groups have to kind of handle and engage. Um, and then in terms of Sinan, what you were saying uh, with respect to the ways in which the war on terror has kind of allowed these um, regimes to kind of forward, um, you know, uh, to kind of expand upon their own uh, 
their own vocabularies and methods and practices. Um, we really see this, uh, you know, with 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 Pakistan in my own field work. Uh, what I've seen is that there's an ability to kind of drop scales, and the moment that things are not directly U.S. involved, that there's not a direct link, it's forgotten about as if it's outside the um, purview or the question of empire. And I think that's a serious limitation in U.S. activism and American sites and spaces that try to think about empire is that, uh, you know, the direct U.S. involvement is seen as the kind of the site to engage in anything outside of that neo-colonial spaces or puppet governments or, you know, those kinds of ambiguous kind of relationships are just written off as kind of not, uh, not part of the kind of conversation and we really need to expand our understanding of those kinds of linkages and understand the way that empire plays with scales, um, and drops things and expands things and makes things bigger and smaller. Yeah, just to jump off on that idea, and this isn't something that I was able to get into in the first 10 minutes, but thinking about both of your presentations and like the concept of um, these families oftentimes contesting the state in unprecedented ways. Um, I think for Palestinians and especially in thinking about um, empire and other forms of empire, these families are not just um, defying the Israeli state, but they're also defying Palestinian leadership who have created these defined geopolitical boundaries that the Palestinian people do not accept. And particularly the families of those people who either have militants in their families or who have had people who have conducted martyred missions or have defied the Israeli state in other ways. So by the families actually organizing, and this is why the national campaign and spaces that document and collect and try to keep this um, activism alive are so crucial because it's not just the Israeli state that is trying to eliminate these voices, but it's also the Palestinian leadership that is trying to kind of marginalize these people or use or tokenize them and say like, yes, we have our martyrs, but not actually doing anything tangible for the families. So the families have felt so, um, they have been really like cast aside and in um, in society and have taken it upon themselves to consider the ways that they can resist um, on their own and, and creating these collectives that are ulterior to the, both the Israeli state and the Palestinian one. And I wonder if there are any similarities in that case where those who are disappeared are also marginalized amongst in the hegemonic state spaces as well. I also wanted to add that, I mean, if you don't want to answer the, the questions, uh, what Amina said about the this tension between consensus and ambiguity, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that and see what the what the others think as that being a force for mobilization and, and action? Certainly. So um, I'm speaking here from kind of the perspective of sociologists who study social movements, and the assumption is that you you need certain elements in order for a social movement to occur. And one of those essential, undeniable, necessary conditions of mobilizing is that there's a, a consensus and agreement about a grievance that has occurred. Um, so that could look like we all agree that there's been a particular injustice that's been um, enacted by the state. And so we're going to mobilize in response. And obviously that is clear in our presentations that um, particular actors are being identified as the source of violence. But I think that the, the sort of element of everyone not being sure about whether their loved one is alive, that that uncertainty, that that ambiguity, that the missing body actually creates a slightly different kind of um, sort of a source of or a catalyst of a social movement because it's not people aren't in agreement. We we're in we're in uncertainty. Um, as, as I think um, Rhonda was was putting this well in the Palestinian context, and I've seen it in Libya as well. Um, and maybe Sinan, you mentioned it too in the Iraqi context. In Libya, there have been posters that say, you know, 
we are restless souls until we can know what has happened and we, and we don't know what has happened we cannot end our mobilization and to me this is qualitatively different than being certain about what has occurred and then contesting the state it's a it's that uncertainty that is actually driving the mobilization forward and the attempt to we could kind of think about them as right to know protests like you're you have a right to know what became of your loved one. What is their fate? Um, and so to me, that's driven by an uncertainty and a, an attempt to acquire knowledge that is not legible in the ways that we think about social movements very often. I think, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. oh, I was just gonna really quickly add to that, which I think part of the, um, like this uncertainty is also the demand for dignity, which seems to be a common thread among all of our presentations also that this, these practices are such an affront to human dignity. And that is oftentimes karame is the word that comes up most often and the reason and the way that these families determine how they are going to resist, whether it is going through lengthy court processes or doing protests or throwing their hands up and saying that um, he's buried or he or she's buried somewhere on Palestinian land and we're not going to play into their to their politics. Um, and so this idea of constantly demanding dignity and a politics of dignity seems so crucial in a way to kind of, that goes hand in hand with this uncertainty that people experience. Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I think uncertainty, I think you're right um, on the, it's just, in my sense is that uncertainty is such a volatile force, right? That for a long time, for instance, you know, the war on terror and this kind of apparatus has been happening since 2001. Um, and then 2004, the drone attacks begin in Pakistan. And you have this movement arise only in 2018. So it takes a very long time. And I, you know, when I've spoken to people in the movement about that, um, you know, part of the, the uncertainty that was generated by this kind of these disappearances and the kill and dumps, et cetera, um, it, it created a sense of suspicion to the point where, you know, even in kin groups, you know, fathers and uh, sons were not sure uh, what was, uh, on whose side the other person belonged. I heard one story where um, the wife of the son became the go-between between, between the father and the and 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 her husband because um, I think the the son was afraid that the father would report him to the authorities for one reason or another, and the father was afraid that the son would report um, him to the ta the, the Taliban. And um, so it, 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 that level of suspicion it it became kind of so pervasive that. Um, as Manzur put it, you know, he's, he said, you know, it, it, it kind of, there was nowhere else for us to go. It had gotten so bad that this movement kind of became a necessity that you would hit, you hit a point where there's just nowhere else to go. But I think in that, in that, in that context, it really requires, you know, people to kind of start to believe in each other over and against that uncertainty, which is a really difficult thing to kind of practice in the everyday. Um, and it's the kind of labor that I think we don't necessarily uh, think about or realize uh, because it has to continue beyond the moment of the like protest and the rally. Um, you're opening your homes to people, et cetera. Um, so this kind of practice of, of believing your, com your comrades really, um, is, 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 is part of this kind of work that is done in the movement. Excellent, I'm gonna pop in here because we have a few moments for some audience Q&A and some questions that have come in from the chat. And I have just one or two very briefly uh, points or questions that I, I wanna add myself here because these are just really rich and fascinating uh, presentations. One thing I, I, I thought was, really coming out in all of, of your presentations because your work focuses so much on the families and the victims and the forms of remembrance and the stories that are behind uh, disappearance, it, it, it makes you realize uh, how um, this state 
practice of violence, disappearance, uh, is actually much more indiscriminate than you might uh, logically assume when you first understand it to be. You know, uh, folks are, are as uh, Madiha's subjects put it, you know, made unknown by the unknown. And, and almost adding to that, it makes you realize that you know the state might act, actually not have the answers either. You know, it's sort of presumed that these people were disappeared because the state has some kind of information on them that deems them, you know, in some sort of clinical way, a threat. Um, but it, it, it's actually much less discriminate than that, uh, and, and, and this is this is a much more blunt tool uh, than, than might be assumed. And, and I think the the work that you all are doing is is putting a lie to that. And I think that's a really important intervention in our understanding of, of the practice. Uh, and and uh, lastly, I mean, I really appreciate uh, Amina's point about. Uh, the misrepresentation of these protests uh, sometimes, and, and Sunan is absolutely right that we have to think these two, two things together, but we shouldn't lose sight of uh, the consequences of that misrepresentation, right? Uh, because you know, when something is, is portrayed merely as you know, an economic grievance and not a grievance against state violence, there are very different reactions that occur both inside the, the country, but outside as well. And the, the geopolitical sh you know, situations can, can shift the, purely on the basis of those representations. So I think that's a really, really important point to, to, to bring up. Um, we have a, a question from the chat, uh, I think directed uh, towards uh, Madiha uh, about uh, you know, how, to, how to recover psycho, psychological and mental health uh, affected in these uh, war zones. Uh, and um, you know, I think that's a, a really critical question for all, all of us who, who especially you, you all who deal with this heavy material all the time. Uh, there's a question from Azba Wahid, uh, also directed to uh, Madiha, uh, wondering uh, if those uh, parts of the PTM see any connections between their struggles and the marginalized and oppressed groups in Pakistan, whether that's religious minorities, ethnic minority groups, et cetera. Is there a feeling of sol solidarity between PTM and others uh, you know, all in this, who are targeted by the same forms of violence? Uh, and a question from Tess Wagoner uh, about, uh, towards, uh, directed towards Rhonda asking her to elaborate on pest optimism as an emerging frame from the Palestinian experience, uh, if and how uh, you know, she might see, you might see the, the concept relating to material remembrances like graffiti uh, and, and other uh, you know, sort of forms of, of public uh, remembrance. So I'm gonna throw all that out there. We'll take a, you know, a, a, maybe a round uh, to pick up whatever uh, you feel like. We'll, we'll be ending the formal period a little bit after two o'clock, but if folks want to have more questions, you'll have a chance to ask them after we stop the recording. Okay, so yes, the first questions are directed to me, so I'll answer them, um, or I'll try to answer them. I think the question of psyche and mental health is, is, is absolutely critical. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I, I do know that um, people in that region um, are taking an immense amount of, um, a lot of drugs, uh, medical drugs, to kind of engage and deal with and manage the anxieties and um, the kind of structural material conditions of the war. And, um, you know, I think this is something that is sometimes in the, in the Western context, like this question is often individualized as like individual therapy, but I think this requires actually concrete material collective work. Um, and uh, I think for some people, PTM really has been a way to have that like collective outlet and have that conversation. And we see that in some ways with, with the, the linguistic registers of PTM. So you know, it is happening, it is a movement that is happening uh, in Pashto, which is the language of the ethnic group of the Pashtuns. And then there is, you know, the, so the speeches will happen in Pashto and then they will happen in Urdu, which is, an, uh, which is sort of supposed to be the national language uh, in, 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 in Pakistan, although not everyone speaks it. But um, uh, so there are two kind of registers at which the, this movement is happening. And I think that also helps to produce collectivities and alliances and insides and outsides. Um, and I think so going from there to the second question about connections, absolutely PTM um, has actively, you know, uh, been working with and has been, you know, there's solidarities between um, 
PTM and uh, Baloch movements that have been uh, in the province of Balochistan, where also there has also been a lot of um, military operations and disappearances. So this is another ethnic group, and these two ethnic groups are the are the heaviest hit. Um, so there's been a lot of solidarities and alliances across these um, two groups. And this is, I think, what is really threatening to the Pakistani state is that um, is the kind of solidarities that are emerging across ethnic groups, because part of the way that they have managed to rule or create the kind of uncertain, create uncertainty and ambiguity is by, you know, exploiting and using ethnic divisions um, and creating ethnic divisions. So um, the fact that, the, you know, at these protests, uh, people from other ethnicities show up um, and the fact that they're so large um, in many in many of these spaces that are not necessarily predominantly uh, Pashtun uh, is uh, has been a matter of concern for uh, the Pakistani establishment. I'll just stop there. Um, I can quickly address the question about pest optimism and material remembrances like graffiti. And um, I've always been struck um, throughout my lifetime and being in Palestine about how much um, graffiti and how much commemoration there is that is visible in front of you constantly. And I'm thinking um, there's a lot of also like state sponsored commemoration as well. And that's not necessarily what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the um, the like large murals that are painted by activists that commemorate um, either prisoners or commemorate martyrs or talk about a um, there's um, there's a there's one in my village in Birzit of a young man who was killed in the village, which is the first thing that you see when you come into the village. And it's just kind of a oftentimes a sobering reminder of um, what has happened like in our direct uh, vicinity. Um, when you walk around in some places like the old city of Nablus, you can actually see the peelings of like really old posters from like the first or, or oftentimes the second intifada. And so you see like an actual physical layering of how much has happened in that city. So I think that for me just signifies um, uh, a lot of the endurance and the samud, the steadfastness of people. Um, I don't know, as time goes on, sometimes that seeing those things kind of recedes into the background, but it is always there as a reminder. And it's a way, it's a form of expression also when there aren't many other outlets of expression. And also graffiti has always been historically important for Palestinians for collective organizing. In the first intifada, graffiti was used as a way to tell people when to go to protest and as a form of anonymity. So in a space that is so repressed and surveilled, having these forms of graphics that are no one knows who put them up necessarily. No one knows who stenciled these, but it is still a way to keep things on people's minds or have a collectivity um, when you cannot necessarily have it in other spaces where you're named. I don't know if uh, Amina or, or Wanda or, or Zanan have um, any uh, final thoughts there, but uh, we're running up on, on two o'clock. Um, so I, I wanna uh, briefly thank uh, Zanan, Amina, Randa, Madiha so much for this uh, fantastic event. Uh, if you missed a part of it or wanna see uh, more of it later, it'll be up uh, on YouTube. Uh, in in about a week's time, we'll you know stay tuned to our uh, YouTube channel or social media pages. Uh, we'll be blasting it out there, uh, and please 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 join us uh, for the final event in global uprisings in a couple of weeks, uh, where we're going to pick up some of these uh, questions.